At the end, very end, I met him and I said, oh, so you do Xing Yi? And, and he was like, yeah. And then basically we spent that night um, with him eating a piece of chicken with one hand and throwing me around a hotel room uh, with the other hand. Hello, everyone. It's episode 98 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Mr. Tom Bizio. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I founded Whistlekick, but I'm also your host for Martial Arts Radio. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear and some awesome apparel, all for those of you involved in the traditional martial arts. Thank you to the returning listeners, and hello and welcome to those of you listening for the first time. If you're new to the show or you're just not familiar with what we make, check out our sparring gear, like our helmets. Very comfortable, with foam that stays soft and protective for a long time. They're a great alternative to the stiffer, lower quality helmets that some other companies make. And if you have children that don't like wearing gear, the foam we use is so flexible that we've seen quite a few children tolerate our helmets and the rest of our gear when they won't wear other equipment. You can learn more about our gear and the rest of our products at whistlekick.com. And don't forget, our gear is also available on Amazon. If you want the show notes, you can check those out at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you're not on the newsletter list, now's a great time. We offer exclusive content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about the upcoming guests for the show. We only email a few times a month. We never sell your information, and sometimes we mail out a coupon. Today's episode is with Mr. Tom Bizio, a practitioner and instructor of, as he refers to it, internal martial arts. We spend a lot of time discussing the martial arts overall, as well as the internal arts. His background is diverse, though, and he's able to tie together a lot of the elements of martial arts, including some we don't typically think about, those around health and healing. It's clear from speaking with him that he's on an educational mission of sorts, making efforts to bring new and revised information to the masses. Let's welcome to the show. Mr. Bizio, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Jeremy, thanks for uh, inviting me on the show. I'm glad to be here. Well, thanks, looking thanks looking for forward to you. chatting with you. Yeah, yeah, this will be fun. We, we have a good time here. And of course, I'm looking forward to getting you know more about you and what you do. And I'm sure the listeners are as well. So let's let's do it the way we always do it. We've got to have some context for how you got to where you are. And the best way to do that is to go back to how you got started. How did you get started in the martial arts? Um, I got started in, when I was 14 at the local YMCA. There was a Korean teacher there who taught various things, but he also taught Taekwondo. So I took a once a week YMCA, you know, 14 week class. And I was probably with him for a year or so or a year and a half. And, and then I wanted to do more martial arts things. So I went on to study Ishin Kempo. Uh, which was kind of a New Jersey thing um, at this one school in Summit, New Jersey. Uh, and it was, it's really Ish and Ru with some, let's say, Chinese boxing added to it, and maybe Western boxing as well. So I did that until I was 17 and then uh, got a black belt there, went to college in New York. And then, you know, there was all kinds of martial arts people that I started to meet. And um, at that time, I got very interested in um, some of Dan and Asanto's writings about the Filipino arts. Um, and so I was looking for a Filipino teacher, but of course, there were hardly any then. And um, I saw this little thing in the back of, I think, Inside Kung Fu, uh, the Advanced Arnis Institute, which happened to be the Philippine consulate on Fifth Avenue. So I showed up there and they looked at me like I was out of my mind and said, oh, yeah, there's this crazy guy who shows up on Sundays. So I came back on Sunday and we were up on the Pelota court uh, on the roof. Um, And then that's where I met Leo Gahi. And I trained with him for um, probably 15 or more years. Um, And that's that's where I felt like I really began studying maybe martial arts in a serious way. Uh, I think before that, it wasn't really as serious for me. That almost sounds like the beginning of of some comic book origin Ooh, story. Yeah, yeah. You know? well, Crazy guy on the roof. You got to come back on oh, Sunday. All these and... rough looking guys. You know, I was like, I was like, tw- I think twenty or nineteen. I guess I was nineteen, and so there were all these big guys, and I was like, wow, this must be the real thing, you know. And but once I saw them do the simplest flow drill, I was just like, wow. 
that's amazing because I'd never, you know, I'd, I'd seen karate, but we had never seen anything like that. Um, and it was interesting. I mean, in the early days, it was just a few of us training out in Queens, um, five or six hours at a time, kind of uh, on odd schedules or meeting in the park. And then as his organization grew, it changed into, into different things. Um, and while I was teaching Filipino arts, I, I had overlaps into Shinichuan. Um, and I met at, actually at one of Leo's camps, I met Vince Black, who um, I'd always read about Shinichuan. I'd loved Robert Smith's books, you know, uh, where he has got the pictures of the masters and something about Wang Shujin's movement in those photos looked very interesting. So, but I never met anybody who did Shingi. And uh, when I met Vince, at this camp where Dan was there and Fred Diggerberg from Chicago. And um, uh, at the end, very end, I met him and I said, oh, so you do Xing Yi? And, and he was like, yeah. And then basically we spent that night um, with him eating a piece of chicken with one hand and throwing me around a hotel room uh, with the other hand and explaining to me the principles. Um, and it, also what interested me was the healing aspect because people would always talk about that, but no one I had met really ever did that. They just did the fighting part. And he, I saw him setting bones and doing different kinds of treatments on people. So from that moment on, I started doing Xingyi while I was doing the Pekita Tercia. And that led me into Kajukembo and Bagua. And um, uh, I also trained in the Philippines with uh, Philemon Cañete after I went there to fight in 1979 and I went back several times to learn his sort of old style um, Dose Paris method. So, you know, at a certain point there's all these overlaps and it's not linear in the process, like a lot of people's uh, trajectories. Right. And that's, I don't want to say necessarily common for the guests that we've had on the show, but I would say at least the majority of the guests that we've had on the show have trained in more than one style under more than one instructor. Oh. And, and that overlap, I think is, I think there's, there's some, I don't want to say necessarily magic there, but I think that there's something pretty special once you start adding different things from different people into the way that you view martial arts as a whole. Oh yes. And when you're teaching one thing and studying another thing, uh, and then that thing creeps into the thing you're teaching and sort of changes your approach to it, which very much happened with me with the internal arts, um, creeping into the Filipino systems. Um, but that's, I think that happens to a lot of people. It's everything kind of feathers together in its own unique way. Yeah. Now, when you mentioned the, the piece about people talking about the healing side of arts, but not being versed in them. There was just something in the way that you said that, that told me that was pretty important to you. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could just tell us a little more about you that. You know, I, I really over, you know, obviously like a lot of people, I probably started out of wanting to defend yourself and choosing Filipino arts at the time I chose them in New York city in the time it was in the, in the seventies, um, was definitely, you know, you want to learn how to fight. Um, but I was always interested in this idea that people knew acupoints and they could, you know, oh, if you got hurt in class, the teacher could fix you. But the reality is that's pretty rare, at least back then. Maybe it's less rare now. There's more people who are martial artists who, like Chris LaCava, who've been to acupuncture school. Um, so they know how to fix stuff. Um, but most of my teachers, if they said they knew how, they didn't really know how. Um, um, so, what, you know, to me, it is important. I think um, one of the things that <clears throat> I don't like about the martial arts scene in, in the U.S. is this lets us extract the killing techniques and forget the rest of the culture and the healing part and the health preservation part and the philosophy part, and the, uh, which a lot of these traditional arts have. Um, like I saw that with Momoy. Here's a guy <clears throat> who's a consummate musician. He writes boleros and stuff, plays the guitar. Um, and at the same time, he's a great martial artist. I would call him very internal, although maybe his method is not an internal way to get there. But um, and, then, um, and then he's doing faith healing in the Filipino tradition. Not something easy for someone like me to learn if you don't grow up in that tradition. But effective, I saw him do things that were pretty impressive. 
um, like just touching points and murmuring a prayer and the person's pain goes away. And he did it on me and I wasn't really a believer in the prayer part. So it was impressive. But that kind of global, um, I don't want to call it Renaissance man thing, but kind of like you, you have all aspects of the art, which is the philosophy, the, the healing, okay, in his case, music, but um, the health preservation aspects, those things. And I think that's why <clears throat> pretty much now I focus on the internal arts more than the arts I did earlier. Now, for people that may not know what you mean by that, could you oh, tell us about uh, okay. internal arts? So, what, so right. internal arts is one of those weird terms because um, it really technically, I guess, means the Chinese internal arts, Shingi Bagua Taiji, maybe Liu Ho Ba Fa, uh, maybe Tongbei. Um, at this point, earlier it included other arts. We could say it includes arts like Aikido, but. I think it's a misnomer sometimes because lots of arts can be internal. So it's much more, I think, about that the training method is an internal training method as opposed to an external training method which focuses more on techniques as the method of um, grasping the art. In the end, I think anybody who's good is probably what I would call internal. In other words, they're they're doing things that are not based solely on their physical wherewithal, uh, either muscular strength, but come from something much deeper. So for me, the distinction is a method. The internal method has very specific steps and approaches, but you can get to the same level of ability through an external method where you focus on techniques and physical strength in the beginning. Got it. Makes sense. But that's just my opinion definition of it because you get 10 internal martial artists together they probably won't agree <laughs> <laughs> that, that that is also a recurring uh, yes. theme on this show the um, the fact that we all do from a bird's eye view anyway the exact same thing yeah and we we can't agree on any of it yeah well in, in any way I think right? some of it's about your internal experience of it right and that's very hard to talk yeah. about so once you start using words, oh, well, he's not using the words I use, so we're not doing the same thing. But in fact, maybe you are. Yeah. I think that's a great way to put it. Yeah. It comes down to language. So I think all of that gives us a wonderful glimpse into you and your journey and where you're at now. And, you know, I can only imagine training Filipino arts in New York in the 70s and what you were exposed to and and so maybe this is going to come from there or a whole other time but i'd love for you to share with us a, one of your great stories you know ideally your best story tell us about uh that. i don't have a best story <clears throat> i have lots of weird stories um, <laughs> <laughs> um i i don't know best story filipino arts um <sighs> i didn't really think about a best story there but uh i remember we would do these, it was this funny story to me. We would do these demos at these Filipino gatherings or street fairs. And um, we'd never get any students from them, you know, because Leo's idea was to, Leo Gahi's idea was to build up the organization, get new people in. And I started to realize why at this one street fair where I think um, Chris Syok was there, I was there, some of the old Frank Ortega. And we're disarming knives, you know, into the crowd. One goes off into the crowd, you know, and, you know, they pull out the machetes and sparks are flying. You know, the crowd's right up against the thing. And some part of me, you know, steps outside myself and goes, we're not going to get one student from this. They all think we're crazy. And, of course, that's exactly – they were all very impressed. But they all thought we were crazy. And, and I, 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 we had a number of demos like that, which – as the longer I was in that system, the more I realized we're never going to get any students this way, you know. Um, so I don't know. It's a funny story, but I, I saw that happen a lot. Uh, another demo we did at the Playboy Club. Um, so I think Dan Asanta was there and he demonstrated with Leo Gahi. Um, and it was just a mess. I mean, there was no preparation so we basically got out there people getting cut with knives people getting there i got my head split open with a stick you know god knows what the crowd made of it i mean a lot of them are martial arts guys so they probably liked it um 
certainly um, Benny the Jet or Kedas came to me after and was like, that was a great demo. Maybe because it looks so realistic. <laughs> 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 uh, but, you know, it was, it was just a lot of stories like that of funny things we tried to do that just didn't quite work out the way we planned. Um, which was as much, you know, some of that was um, the nature of the way Leo Gahi approached things, where it had to be no preparation, real, and just make it up on the spot. And some of it was probably the rest of us being knuckleheads to some degree. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm still kind of stuck on that first one with the knives flying into the crowd and, and that. Oh, or pieces of metal coming off machetes. Who knows where they go? I mean, we're lucky nobody sure. got not, got hit with something you know it's... but there's quite the paradox there isn't there that people were enthralled they wanted to watch close up i mean there, there's a, a general fascination with combat violence yeah. however you want to look at it but yet nobody wanted to actually participate yeah i mean and you, you god knows what how you know you, you can't really step outside yourself and so say how would it look to me if i saw that and i didn't know what it was because you, you're involved in it and you love it, so you don't really think like that. You think like, how could they not have liked that? You know. And <laughs> I did a similar right. demo at my school once to get more students, and we did um, the same thing with the machetes, and we did kajukembo, where we started out by heaving a medicine ball full force on people's stomachs, which is part of the training, and then, you know, full blast kajukembo stuff, and. I had the Kyokushin guys coming up to me who came to visit saying, great, that was amazing. Nobody signed up, though. I mean, nobody had any interest in the craziness of it. And and now I don't really do that kind of crazy anymore. <laughs> so it, it's all like in my youth, kind of. And the Kyokushin guys know. Oh, they're brutal, tough right? guys. So, I would. Yeah. I saw so them it's, it's, far and I wouldn't want to do what they do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of funny. I'm like, you guys are kind of thinking this is crazy like wow yeah, that, that's, that's a lot <laughs> i know that's i know I, but, but i mean i on the other hand if i saw what they do which i have seen i'd be like i don't want to do that um so, i mean i've done that but i don't want to do it anymore uh or that kind of thing <clears throat> so so that's one funny story well that's great uh, those those are great and and i'm sure you've got a bunch more and maybe we'll, maybe we'll get just some come more out, yeah Move for, further along, yeah. Now let's let's pretend we go back to that fourteen week course at the YMCA, that Taekwondo class, and you know you you never end up there, or maybe the instructor isn't inspiring. You, you decide, you know what, this martial arts thing isn't for me. Where do you think you would be in your life now right. without martial arts? It's really hard to know. Because my whole life since then has been martial arts and Chinese medicine, which came for me out of the martial arts. I mean, even when I teach it, it's I'm basically just doing Xingyi or, or Bagua while you're working on somebody. Um, so it, I I don't know where I'd be. Um, it's I can't even imagine it. I mean, my son is 26 and he's just starting out in his career, so it's interesting to. And he's not interested in martial arts, so it's interesting to see that path, which is, and I've seen other people's paths. Um, but for me, I, I don't, it's so long. I mean, I've spent more of my life in martial arts than out. So, I mean, I'm going to be 60 next year. I've been doing it since I'm 14. So I can't really imagine a not a life not doing it, which is. Yeah. I don't know. If, and this, I don't know if that really answers the question, but it, it does. Yeah. It does, and it doesn't, and and that's okay. I mean, this is the question that. And I actually, at one it, point, I thought when I got into acupuncture more heavily, you know, I learned I learned a lot of the stuff I do in, from uh, Shingi and Bagua training under Vince Black, um, and then I went to school and I apprenticed in herbs and to to get to go to that next level with it. But at one point I thought, yeah, I think I'm just going to do this and not do martial arts. But but actually I realized that all of my medicine really flows from the martial arts and my abilities with the medicine flow from it. So it's inescapable at this point. Um, I can't really just be an acupuncturist or just be an herbalist because my understanding of the body comes out of the martial arts. 
and we're prescribing exercises from the martial arts for patients as rehabilitation. So it's, it's, um, it's not really possible to separate it. Interesting. Do you see, no, let me re-ask that. So certainly your involvement with the arts and the way that you've approached it has shifted. Yes. Over time as, as your careers come into play and training different things. Do you expect that to continue? Um, yeah, I, I think it's already continuing. I mean, I see with in the current martial arts scene, which I don't pretend to really completely know, um, but let's say within my field, most people who come to internal arts are not interested in fighting techniques per se. That might be a small part for them. I think most people are interested in health. They're interested in med is a meditation or some kind of way of life or philosophy. Um, and then there's a smaller percentage that sees it as a, actually developing martial skills. Um, now, it's a martial arts, so people have to learn some martial skills. But it's already changed the way I teach because you can't – people don't necessarily you – know, not everybody wants to do the fighting and getting thrown on the ground and joint locks and getting hit. And, um, so I've, I've changed a lot. I think my medicine practice, uh, for, which I did for 25 years, and I'm, I'm now currently on sabbatical from for a while um, – has influenced that because I'd get people who are patients and then they come to the class because they see that all the people who take the class are very healthy and then, but they don't necessarily want to do the combat part or the fighting part. So we make them do just enough that it helps facilitate the health part. Um, so that's a balance I'm working with now, uh, trying to figure out my way through that into the next 20 years or so. All right. And then I do train uh, currently some of the people I'm training with in China. I mean, one of them is Zhao Daiyuan, who is retired from the teaching the secret police, the Delta Force in China, and the um, the bodyguards for officials. So he's a very fighting oriented guy in one way. And, you know, we've been taking students to work with him a little bit. And it's mostly technique oriented and joint locking and throws and things. So, of course, I'm still interested in that. But it's I, I divide between the people that want to do that and the people that don't want to do that a little bit. Sure, sure. All right. And, you know, to, to respond to your question, no, it's – this is the question that everyone has a really hard time with. And that's why we continue to ask the question. <laughs> yeah, I'd imagine. Uh, because – I have a personal belief that the people that find martial arts find martial arts because they were supposed to, you know, whether you call that destiny or whatever fate, there's just something about martial arts that for the people that find it and stick with it for even a little while, it's hard to pull it back out of them. Even if they do stop training, it's true. And that, and that when you, if you were to ask someone who, let's say, trained for 10 years and then stopped for 20, if you really got them to consider their training honestly and the impact it has on their life as they move forward, it's a it's pretty deeply rooted in there, even if they're not kicking and punching anymore. No, and often when I've talked to people like that, it's um, it's life circumstances that led them to not train. Um, you know, whatever they had three kids, they had a job that didn't allow them to train regularly. So they're still somehow in, inside themselves, consider themselves a martial artist, which is interesting. So, yeah, I think we choose what we're drawn to things for some reason. Um, and if you're drawn to it, you find it or you in some way or another. Right. I agree. All right. So let's pull back to reality. You know, no more hypotheticals here. <laughs> <laughs> these, these are generally a lot easier for people. Uh, how about a tough point in your life? Something that, that you struggled through, but you were successful in at least part due to your martial arts experience? Um, I can't think of a particular tough point. I mean, that I, I think in any tough moment, martial arts is always the fallback thing where as soon as you... I begin to train in it, I feel, you feel reconnected to some, something that is, um, ooh, like, a 
that nourishes you, that uh, fulfills you, that energizes you. Um, so I think at, at any point when I was having difficulty in school or uh, in life, it's, it's the, the martial arts was always a constant there. I mean, sometimes I was training a lot, and some, there are periods where I wasn't training as much. But it was always the, the go-to thing to kind of reinvigorate uh, yourself in a positive way. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't have any particular one point like that. That's okay. That, that, honestly, that's probably a very good thing. Yes. For a no, lot of people, it's, it's very, very, lucky thing. Uh, very, very clear what that time in their life is. And we, we've had some, some rough stories and, and people that have been with the show for a while know we've heard some pretty intense answers to that question. So, Congratulations that you don't have one of those. <laughs> yes, I'm lucky. <laughs> so you've mentioned quite a few names of people that you've had experience with training mm -hmm. under. And if we were to exclude anyone that you would label as a direct instructor. Okay. Because this is where I think the better stories come from. Who would you say has had the most influence on your martial arts career? Anyone who's a direct instructor. Wow. Um, I, I don't, I mean, okay. So I, uh, I've had a couple of older Chinese instructors that I didn't really train with much. In other words, they kind of oversaw a little bit and had their students, but I didn't really get to train with them or one of them I trained with for a few times and then, he died, but I felt they were very influential on my approach to the internal arts. Um, I think Dan and Santu, I didn't, I mean, I think I met him once at a seminar with Leo Gahi a couple of times, but I didn't really train with him. Uh, was very influential, clearly, because without him, who would have even heard of the Filipino martial arts in the 70s, uh, unless you lived in certain parts of California or were in that small world there. Um, so he was very influential at a certain period. Um, I, I do think some of uh, Robert Smith's writings were very influential for me. Um, there's something about, I mean, he's a good writer, something in what he conveyed that made me really seek out the, or, or be look kind of on the lookout for internal arts that matched up to what I saw in his books. Um, I don't know if I'm answering the question you're asking, but exactly. Well, let's, let's, let's open it up a little bit because it, it I'm, you know, I'm kind of reading between the lines and it sounds like there may be somebody that you're, you're ruling out. So if I was to ask it, who was the most influential person in your martial arts career? Who would that be? Um, I don't think there's one. I think I, I'd say, really? Lee, huh? um, I'd say in some ways I have to say Leo Gahi, um, because for me it was the, like I said, the first thing where I felt like, Oh, this is the real thing. Um, and his level of ability, um, his ideas about that things had to be realistic, that it had to be counter for counter, that it couldn't be static. Um, the ability to ad lib in the moment according to the circumstances. I think that was very influential because then everything you study after that has to somehow match up to that. So even though Xing Yi, he would have probably not liked Xing Yi um, because it's forms, right? It's fixed forms that you do a lot. I think the result of the Xing Yi and Bagua, where it is changing with the changing circumstances, he would have liked. And, and I think it's his influence that made me find teachers that convey that. Um, so I have to say he's the most and probably behind him, it would be Vince Black because that was like a sea change from doing Filipino arts to going into medicine and internal arts. All right. So those are the t probably the two most. I mean, now in more recent years, there were Wang Shutong and Ba Guajong in China who I only trained with briefly when he was already fairly crippled, but he was impressive nonetheless. 
and taught me a lot of the secrets of his way of training. And Li Gui Chong, and, and, uh, who I only oversaw training with, with some of my now school brothers in Shanxi, China, um, just an impressive, a small, slightly built guy, incredibly powerful, incredibly sensitive, incredibly refined kung fu. But I never got to train with him. But, but just when I watch him on tape, it's, it, you just go, wow. That's like perfection in Xing Yi. Um, that I, you know, you just go, well, I, uh, can I even ever get close to that? Probably not. Uh, mm. and, th and then it's, that's, that influences you because you, it sets the bar high. Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. So, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Okay. I don't want to cut you off. This, this is your show. No, 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 no. Your episode. I, I, I think I answered right. that. I don't think there's more to say on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So let's talk about competition. I think I heard you say something about having traveled to the Philippines yeah. to fight. Yeah. So, uh, so we, there's at least a little bit of competition that's happened through your career. Tell us. Yeah, what you've I, done. I was. I only was interested in competition as a test. Um, so I never did it a lot. Um, uh, and it, with uh, with Leo Gahi, we had never done any full contact sparring up until the point of 1979, where they had the first Arnis Championships in Cebu City. Um, and he, uh, Leo Gahi had been there uh, for like, I think he'd been there eight months. So we'd been training without him on our own, um, knowing that he was going to come back at some point. And um, he sent out a call for, we need a couple guys here to participate in this tournament. So uh, luckily I inherited a little bit of money. I had the free time. I was think I was just finishing my senior year of college and I was done with most of my coursework. So I thought, what the hell, I'll try it. So I trained, but I didn't know what the rules would be. Um, and then, uh, I flew there and, um, fought in this, the so-called first national tournament in Cebu city where they invited the screamadors from all over the, the Philippines. And I believe, uh, I was probably, I think I was the only non Filipino in that tournament. Um, so I ended up <clears throat> fighting in the senior instructor division, which was supposed to be people with 10 years experience. I had three and, um, I mean, it didn't really matter because it, it, when you looked at it, you could see people just jumped in a different, some people really had 10 years. Some people didn't in that division. Um, but it was uh, it was interesting because I it was uh, I didn't know what the rules were going to be. I really had no idea, and that was my first contact also with the Dose Paris group, uh, with the Kenyette clan, and and a lot of their people. So it was an interesting experience um, to fight there, and I ended up tying for the um, the um, championship in that senior instructor division. The main tie was, I think the other guy didn't want to fight me when we came down to the final and I was pretty tired. So I was like, great. <laughs> Let's be co-champions. Good. I like that. Uh, Cause it was, you know, with the time change and the, the heat and also not knowing that they would be 20 second rounds. So you're going all out for 20 seconds. I didn't actually train correctly for it. Um, and I was pretty exhausted by the by the end of the the third fight I'd had, and this was going into the fourth fight. So I was sure. I was happy to say, sure, let's be co-champions. So for anyone that hasn't seen that kind of competition, we, we've had other Filipino art practitioners on, and, and we talked about the Dog Brothers competition, and we we've linked video in our show notes for that. And if anybody hasn't. Uh, if you're new to the show or just want to check out the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. But maybe for for my benefit as well as everyone else's, what did that competition look like? I mean, 20-second rounds, are you wearing a uh, We had headgear and some kind of a light pad over the knuckles <clears throat> and a sort of smock that was lightly padded. But by the end, a lot of us had kind of gotten rid of it because it was hot. Um, I think you couldn't hit the legs, as I recall, um, three disarms and you lose three throws and you lose, but you couldn't do a body to body throws. They had to be, or they had to be quick throws. So it could be a body to body throw, but it had to be, you know, bam throw. If it was like, you're struggling like in a judo match and then you throw that didn't count. 
And the same with the disarming. If you grab the guy's stick and then wrestled and then pulled it loose, the referee would break it before then. Okay. Um, also, if you hit somebody and lost your stick, that counts as a disarm. So those rules were then adopted by uh, Leo Gahi's organization for a number of years, um, except we, I think, allowed hitting the legs. Um, and we got slightly stronger headgear because people were using slightly heavier sticks than they were using in the Philippines. Um, but that became the rules in his organization for a period of time with the 22nd rounds, um, which is rough because doing road work, which is what I did, didn't, doesn't train you for that. It's anaerobic. Right. Yeah, so you have to train sprint training, and which I learned later when we did some tournaments here. And then I found if you did the sprint training, you didn't get tired in the same way. Um, but it was it was interesting. Um, from that, uh, the, one of the founders of Dog Brothers, Eric Canaus, who studied with me in the when I started to teach our niece, our Filipino arts, um, we started to do knife fighting, and we 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 originally just took some fencing masks, beat up fencing masks from the Columbia University fencing room, made gloves where we put like, we, uh, I think we tied um, rubber onto the gloves and we just sparred with knives. And I, I think those, and then later when Eric was involved, starting to get involved with the Dog Brothers thing, I, I went out and met him and we did some sparring. And that was much more the Dog Brothers style. But we had started to do that in our school uh, early on, and he had done it in California before he founded the Dog Brothers, but but not just as training, not not um competitive, really. Right, sure. You know, I, just personally, I find it fascinating training sparring at that level of danger. You know, I, I come from a fairly vanilla background, I guess, in comparison with with karate and taekwondo and foam gear and trying not to hit and uh, yeah. and all that so I, I mean, it just kind of blows my mind when when we get to hear from somebody like that and i'm sure you're coming out of there banged up and bruised oh, yeah and i th i think um i mean nobody was in the in the when we did it in the school nobody was trying to hurt any you know it's not a competition right so you don't have sure. that level of aggression uh past a certain point um <laughs> Even when in Xing Yi, we used to do full contact sparring. It's, uh, I mean, full contact in quotations. We're wearing bag gloves, so there's no protection from the glove. Um, but nobody's trying to kill anybody. Nobody's trying to knock people out. We're just trying to try our techniques. And, and then you can engage in pretty hard sparring without a lot of damage being done. Now, you've trained with a whole bunch of great people, but if you had a chance to train with someone that you haven't yet, who would you want to train with? I, uh, the people I, I mean, the people that I wanted to train with who are not alive or I've never met, uh, would probably be, uh, Yue Shiba or his tops, his original group of students, uh, in Aikido. Um, I mean, if I was younger <laughs> and if I had the time, like I did in the past, it would have been nice to get that perspective on things. Cause I think they have a very interesting perspective. And I think his original group of students by all indications knew things that are not commonly taught as Aikido today. Um, and Aikido and Bagua and Chinese arts do seem to have a, a bunch of similarities in their approach to certain things. Um, certainly. I'd like to have trained with Li Ziming in Bagua. I've trained with two of his disciples. Um, but as he taught differently to different disciples, and, and it's clear when you look at them that their skills are very varied, it would have been nice to see, A, the full realm of, of Li's skills, and also what it is he would have thought would be necessary for me to learn. Um, is that, that's always interesting if you could do it yeah. in a hindsight, I guess, on some level. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, uh, the, the two, um, other people, uh, Li Gui Chong, who I studied, I mean, I technically I'm his disciple, but in fact, I studied very little directly with him. I mostly studied with, um, his disciples who are then 
technically my school brothers, particularly Song Ziyong. But but Lee was just, um, I mean, his even song talks about him in reverential tones, the stuff he saw him do over the years and his abilities. And when you watch him move, it's like perfect Xing Yi. I mean, if you freeze frame, the lines of his body are perfect, which is very, very difficult to achieve. And I know, I think Song believes he'll never achieve it. I certainly don't believe I'll achieve it in my lifetime, but, but you know, that's your goal. Uh, and Wang Shitong, who I train with, um, he had been injured in the head during the culture revolution. Um, so when I train with him, he, his legs actually didn't work that well, which is tough to do Bagua, but yet he was still able to impart to me a lot of the essence of Bagua, a lot of things that people don't teach today in Bagua, and, and still like could rock me off the walls of the hotel room, even though he couldn't really move his feet that fast. Um, so just an impressive guy with a lot of knowledge, but I didn't get to learn from when he could really manifest all the skills. So that mm-hmm. would have been a great thing. Um, and then uh, more recently, since I, a friend of mine has studied is a Kunt, uh, studied Kuntao and Silat with Willem de Tours, um, I definitely think if I could, it would have been nice to have studied with him in the particularly the Kuntao, which is <clears throat> seems to be arts from southern China mixed with some internal arts transplanted to Indonesia and Malaysia, um, where blade fighting and weapons fighting was still used in more recent history. So they didn't lose the um, the realism of uh, the use of Chinese weapons and the basic training of the Chinese weapons, which you you don't typically see in mainland China. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but most people are doing it more for performance or to perform a form, or they're doing it as simply a shenfa, body training aspect, and not for the realistic use of the weapons. Uh, right. So uh, I, those are all people I wish I could have studied with either more or studied with at all. Um, Th- those all sound like incredible people. And, you know, I'm, I'm st- standing here and, and realizing that I don't have a lot of experience in the Chinese arts or the internal arts and just kind of wishing just the, the reverence that you have for these people, the way you're speaking about them. I, I would jump in to train with any of them with both feet, you know, without knowing anything about them. <laughs> oh, it's all right. clear, uh, how much uh, you respect them. So that that's certainly carrying through to me. Okay, great. So, so that must mean those are great choices. Well, the great choices for me, I think, you know, that right, for other people, right. they might not be the right choice, you know, but yeah. So let's steer off a little bit. Let's, let's talk about some things that are a little lighter. Okay. Uh, how about movies? Are you a martial arts movie fan? Yeah, I, I love martial arts movies. I must have like a hundred of them. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> That's, you, you qualify as a fan. Yeah. Right? So, you know, I, I find them like, uh, I think the formulaic quality is just this, it's very satisfying. It's like eating candy, you know? And so when you want to not think too much, you just put on a martial arts film and enjoy it for what it is. There are certainly horrible ones and I own a bunch of those and I probably watch them once and never watch them again. Uh, and then there are ones that you watch, you know, every year or so just, um, uh, cause, cause you enjoy the formula. And, um, I, I particularly, uh, Particularly like uh, the ones with, with Jet Li and Jackie Chan. I mean, I guess because they're Chinese arts, but some of them are quite well made. I like the intensity and um, incredible movement of both of them. But I also love Jackie Chan's just sense of humor and, um, you know, his whole thing. I, I saw him once in an interview where he said, you know, so Bruce Lee would take out all these guys, but I'd hit the guy and then have to hold my hand after where he exchanges shin kicks and then he rubs his leg. I, I, I just think it's so real in one way. And it, it's so, it, it, it takes the whole Kung Fu genre and turns it on its head a little bit, makes it funny, but I enjoy all kinds of Kung Fu movies um, or martial arts movies. I like, um, Tony Ja, I like some of um uh well I'm spacing on his name. Anyway, I, I like a bunch of them. Uh, the the other one I really liked more recently from the Thai kind of point of view was Chocolate. I don't know if you've seen that one. No. It's the girl who's um kind of a 
idiot savant at martial arts. So she, she's, she's autistic, but she can learn martial arts like nobody's business. And she goes to collect money for her mother from some gangsters. And they, they, they go to beat her up. And then she just unleashes. And it's kind of out of that Tony Ja fight school kind of camp where they just do incredible stunts in one take, um, which are amazing, you know, just physically amazing. Mm. Uh, it's also amazing how brutally they get hurt in the filming um and how casually they shake it off um kind of like the jackie chan outtakes at the end um yeah which which are equally as amazing as the movie usually um so yeah i i, I like all those things cool. awesome how about books um so books um you know, I, I once probably had 300 books when I had a, a school way back, a, reg, a, a full-time school, and um, everything from the old Oyama books to the uh, Katori Shinto Ru to Wing Chun to Filipino arts. Um, a lot of the books I liked when I was younger, um, which are more technique-oriented, don't interest me much now, so I, I got rid of a lot of them. Um, probably could get rid of some more. Mostly now I'm interested in books from the Chinese arts that relate to things I do. Um, and I'm more interested in books that give you insight into either a major figure in martial arts like Yueshiba, about what, uh, of whom much has been written. So uh, for in his case, I really like the book by Ellis Amdor, Hidden Plain Sight, which goes into some of the historical and speculative about the, the developmental process of Aikido and people Yueshiba may have seen, not even necessarily trained with, but seeing them do something and may have influenced him. So I think that's a really interesting book. Um, uh, books, uh, of course, that I mentioned, I think, earlier, the, um, the books on Shingi and Bagua by... Um, uh, I'm forgetting his name. <laughs> names are names are going out of my head. It's uh, okay. Um, Chingy Chuan, mind body boxing, um, and uh, where they had, he had pictures of um, uh, Wang Shu Jin and other famous boxers and discussions of meeting in Taiwan with them. Uh, I think those are great books. They give you a feel for the people and the martial art and. Uh, the background and, and, and very impressionistic um, writing about them. Um, the Heart of Karate Do by Agami, a mostly a technique book on Shotokan, but a very interesting piece in the beginning about his um, training in Shotokan and developing various kinds of internal problems and realizing he was training incorrectly and too hard and going back to this softer approach that he felt was more what Funakoshi had taught and how that changed his whole outlook on martial arts. So I, I think those kind of books are very mm. inspiring to, to see people's struggles with figuring stuff out. Um, which is what um, we're always trying to do to some degree with martial arts uh, to figure out how to get to that next level. Um, I, I also really like the Taiki Ken book, which is long out of print by Kenichi Sawai, um, which again, it, it's very photographically nice book because it's done in the style of some of the older Japanese books. Um, but it gives you it gives you a, a feeling of his movement, a feeling of the movement of his students without really showing you techniques. I think they show a few exercises and things. So, um, and then um, you know, but I, uh, I I think I, I mentioned to you off the thing about uh, about Bruce. T I, you know, I started with Bruce Techner books, which are techniques, and I learned how to fall from them, and I learned how to do joint locks from because they had little lesson plans in them. <laughs> And it was great. I mean, so when I got when I got to learning judo, I already knew most of the ways of falling. I mean, I obviously didn't know them as well, and judo training refined them. But um, is is in you know they were great books for their time. I mean, certainly they're kind of outdated now, maybe, but they still have some validity. So. You know, I now I write my own books on Bagua and for my students and training manuals. I don't I don't think they're very interesting outside for the most part outside of if you do this kind of training because they're more they're more to a uh, sort of accompaniments to the training process. So they're not the kind of inspirational books that I'm talking about. Okay. 
Um, yeah, I think that that pretty much answers it. All right. Uh, so you've had quite the path, and obviously you're you're not fading away. I mean, it seems not. pretty clear. <laughs> It seems pretty clear as we've we've spoken that, I mean, I'm almost getting this sense that you are more passionate about martial arts and your involvement in martial arts now than you were, say, 20 years ago. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, or maybe the passion is different. Um, okay. I mean, I was always passionate, but it's so much less about um, being skillful at fighting yeah. and more about the perfection of the the technique and the principles of the art and also getting other people how do you get other people to learn that how do you empower them to mm. get that path of internal self-discovery with their own art so that they're not just parroting back moves that you've taught them uh, can you do move 3a but they that it becomes a living breathing art within them that's what interests me and it's the same thing I'm trying to do with medicine, you know, where you go to school and it's just memorize all this stuff. And, and certainly, like in any, in martial arts and in Chinese medicine, you have to, that's a period of training, right? You have to do the foundational work. You have to memorize martial techniques and learn how to do them and learn the technical details. It's the same in Chinese medicine. But then there's the point of putting it all together. And that's where you have to transcend those... Um, those technical aspects into something more than that. And, um, you know, I've, I feel like in the last year, I've kind of realized that's what I'm doing because some people have said it to me, like one guy in an acupuncture class said, Oh, you're freeing my acupuncture. In other words, freeing him from the theory and just looking at the moment of the encounter with a patient and what do I need to do? Does it matter if it's the actual point that the book says, or is it where the energy is blocked right now? Um, or in an actual encounter with, with physical tween and bone setting skills. So, um, I think actually that's what I'm trying to do in the medicine is get away from the school thing and the technical aspects and get people to understand how to put it together into something that's living. Um, and in martial arts, I think the influence of Bagua, the whole idea that there's an encounter, uh, whether it's a physical encounter or not, and there's certain circumstances in the moment, and do you change with the changing circumstances smoothly and seamlessly, or do you not? Uh, which is very hard to do because we, we tend to come to things from a perspective with a preset idea. So how do you, how do you have all the skills of Bagua or Xingyi in you, but you let go of them in the moment that you're actually using them? And how do you teach people to do that? Obviously, first they have to learn the technical skills and go according to the method of learning and follow the rules of the method. But then there's the moment where you have to transcend the rules. Um, and I think that's true in any art, no matter what martial art you do, or maybe any art at all, painting, music. Uh, so that's what I'm more interested in now. Um, of course, I'm still learning techniques because I'm going to China to study with Zhao Daiyuan and we're learning Chinna techniques. <laughs> so, but we're also getting insight into the way he thinks about them and the underlying principles of them. But of course, part of it is you're still learning technical things. Right, right. And I think a lot of times that technical stuff is just an easier way to explain the internal stuff. It's true. It's why internal artists have so much trouble teaching their art if they don't want to do it from, because there are, you know, some things like each one, they don't want to do it from a technical perspective, but then it's incredibly hard to learn mm. because you're just learning some body principles and some training principles and you kind of have to, the rest is supposed to unfold naturally, but it's very difficult to do that. And it's the rare person who can actually manifest that in my opinion. Uh, yeah, because when, when you're new at something, I mean, what's the first thing you do? Am I doing this right? Yes. And if that if that's not even the right question, yeah, then it can really throw somebody for a loop. Yeah, and Chinese teachers traditionally don't really answer many questions. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I think the most dangerous moment is when they ask you, 
oh, now I'll answer questions. Do you have a question? That's when the minefield opens before you. Because mm-hmm. if you ask the wrong question, it can shut the whole thing down. It's really, it's really always like a little bit like treading in a minefield training in China, even with teachers that like you and you like them, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there's a, there's a cultural difference. Yeah, it there. is, it's, you know, yeah. Wow. But, uh, but to that end, I, I think, um, I'm kind of moving more towards doing seminar format teaching because I find that, uh, and, and we've got a lot of things in the medicine and the martial arts lined up in the coming couple of years to try and bring those things together more, both that people who do medicine, maybe studying some martial arts helps them and people who do martial arts learn the healing aspect that goes with the martial arts. But also I like the intensive format. Um, like when people come in a weekly class, it's very difficult sometimes for them to you they, you correct something, it kind of gels maybe in the last three minutes of the class, then they don't practice for two days for whatever reason. They come back the next week. It's like you're teaching the same thing again. I yeah. find in the intensive, you know, you do a whole weekend, eight, six hours a day, people get it. And they get it in their body halfway through the weekend. So then it sticks with them. And, and also maybe you're self-selecting people that are self-motivated to train on their own because they're only meeting you four times a year or six times a year or something like that. Um, to that end, we've also started doing some um, online learning seminars in Bagua, uh, courses in Bagua. With, and, um, and that's been interesting because I resisted it for a long time thinking, oh, you can't really learn that way. And on the one hand, you can't really learn that way, but you can learn more than you think that way. And then if people Mm. get live instruction, it's like they've already, it's like you're teaching someone who's not a beginner already. Um, And uh, we've had a couple of people come out of that into our instructor training program in Bagua for the foundational level and done quite well. Oh, interesting. Well, it also self selects motivated people, right? Who are willing to train on their own and think about things, and so it's it's interesting and a new thing for me. Cool. So when it comes to seminars and and those online trainings and whatever, how do people find out more? How can um, you know? How can people engage with you and learn from um, you? Internalartsinternational dot com spelled out. Um, or you can, I think it also goes from New York Internal Arts too to the same website. Um, basically, we're we're now revamping the site at this moment, uh, so we're putting up a schedule of all the seminars and events. Um, I post articles there every month on different things about primarily internal arts and medicine. We have a membership thing, archive with video, and I think probably two hundred articles at this point on different aspects of internal arts that people. Mm-hmm. join but you can also just join the mailing list and you don't have to be a member or pay the membership fee um so that's a, if people are on the mailing list then we send out a monthly newsletter um with upcoming events and posts on upcoming events and occasional extra newsletters on a, a maybe a book that's coming out or some special event i try not to bombard people with too many emails you don't spam them i, I try not to <laughs> <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, that's all. This this has all been awesome, and, and I really appreciate it. But let's, you know, we always try and go out on a on a really high note. Do you have any advice that you'd like to leave the listeners with? Um, I think uh, my I, I'm, I'm assuming the listeners are probably martial artists, so um, uh, almost exclusively. yeah. So um, I would say you know, there's those points in your in your training where you get frustrated and you, you, whatever you want to call it, like you feel like you've hit a plateau. And I remember that very clearly in the Filipino arts and certainly in the internal arts in different periods um, where you just feel like you suck basically. And you've been training for 20 years. Um, (laughs) um, And I, I always think that's often like where sometimes people quit, not, not if they've been training 20 years, but sometimes they've been training three. and that's often when you get to the next level is when you feel like nothing works um, or you don't under, even understand why you're doing it, what you're doing. Um, I think one Chinese uh, writer from the past, and she said something like, when you've entered the maze of doubts, 
um, that's when you're going to get better. And that, that if every, when everything's going smoothly and you feel like, oh, everything moves good, I got the forms, I got the kicks, you're actually, well, he says very clearly, if you practice your whole life like that, you'll achieve nothing. But if you actually get to the point where you feel like you're doing everything wrong, and when you come out the other side of that, that's, then, you're, then you're making progress. And I think um, that's something I'd leave with everybody because it was a lesson for me that that's actually when you go see your teacher or maybe you meet another person who says something to you in that moment where you think, I'm doing everything wrong, and suddenly it flips and you realize you've made progress. Because when you're making progress, actually – Things that felt comfortable don't feel so comfortable during that change point. Thank you for listening to episode 98 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Mr. Bizio. If you missed the link to Mr. Bizio's school, head on over to the show notes to grab that, get on his newsletter, and learn more about the free resources his organization puts out. If you like the show, please be sure you're subscribing or using one of our free apps. They're available on both iOS and Android. For those of you kind enough to leave us a review, remember, we randomly check out the different podcast review sites like iTunes and Stitcher. And if we find your review and mention it on the air, be sure to email us for your free pack of Whistlekick stuff. Those reviews are a lot more important than you may think. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or if you want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that too. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. And our username is always, you probably guessed it, Whistlekick. Remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com or on Amazon, like the fantastic sparring helmets. If you're a school owner or a team coach, you should check out our wholesale site at wholesale.whistlekick.com. We give you guys some exclusive discounts and bulk pricing over there. But we'll be back soon. So until next time, train hard, smile and have a great day.